I'm the Intense MD, a double board certified intensivist here to give you an inside look into the intensive care unit. I'm going to start with a disclaimer. This video is for informational purposes only. It is not to provide medical advice or medical diagnosis. It's just to provide information about a topic. So today we're going to be discussing blood clots. This has been a hot topic in the news this week due to the J&J &J vaccine being pulled. So I just wanted to shed some light on blood clots in general. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more to say about blood clots. I debated doing a two part video, but my analytics told me that most people will not come back for part two. So we're going to try to do this in one shot. In the body, there is a process called the coagulation cascade. And this is how different factors and proteins in the blood work to keep the blood thin enough that it doesn't clot, but thick enough that you don't bleed. If somebody is missing or has a low amount of any factor in this pathway, then they can either bleed too easily or clot too easily. That's a very oversimplified explanation of this, but I don't want to go too in-depth because this is not a medical school lecture. We're going to talk a lot about the blood vessels in the body, so just a reminder that arteries take blood away from the heart and lungs to the other organs, so these organs can get the oxygen and nutrients in the blood and after that blood is used up by the organs it goes into the veins where the blood travels back to the heart and lungs where it can gather more oxygen in the lungs and then get pumped out again through the heart so i'm going to focus mostly on blood clots that happen in the veins in this video but i'm going to start by mentioning some situations where you can get blood clots in your arteries just so you're aware of those things happening as well. So you can get arterial thrombi in the limbs, so in your arms and legs, and so then your arms, legs, fingers, toes aren't getting the blood supply they're used to. A lot of times in these situations, patients' hands, feet can start turning blue or black or white just because it's not getting the blood supplies used to, and it gets cold. So this is typically an emergency. So this needs either an emergent blood thinner or an emergent surgical procedure to remove the blood clots. So in these situations where we're looking for blood clots in arteries, we do something called an angiogram and that is just shooting dye through the artery and seeing where the blockage is because when you're looking at the film in real time, you'll see the dye going and then just stop abruptly where you would expect it to continue. So moving on to the veins. So one of the more common types of blood clots that most people think about are DVTs or deep vein thrombosis. So these are clots that form in the deep veins. Clots in the deep veins are more concerning because they have a higher chance of traveling through the venous vasculature back up to the lungs. The risk for getting a DVT or any blood clot are very similar. One, I've talked about how some people may have clotting disorders where they form clots more readily. Also, people who are obese that are a high risk of blood clots, people who smoke, pregnant women, certain medications like birth control pills, cancer itself can increase the risk of clots. So there are many things that can increase the risk and also, it, a lot of times, if you are immobile for a period of time, if somebody's had a recent fall, broke their hip, haven't been moving around as much, they're at increased risk. If somebody's been in a long car ride, cross-country road trip, things like that. Like the classic board question is somebody who's a smoker, went on an international flight, and all of a sudden they have a swollen leg. So all of these things can increase the risk of a DVT and some things that we do in the hospital to prevent this is we'll give a lower dose blood thinner. We'll put on these like compression sleeves on people's calves to kind of push, help push the blood through. So how do we find DVTs? We do an ultrasound. So we'll look at the ultrasound and we'll see the blood vessel is not compressing. That usually, a vein is usually easily compressed and I'll show you here my own veins. Um, so that tells us there's nothing inside there preventing it from 
being pushed down. Um, many times you can also see the clot itself in the vein. So treatment for this is giving blood thinners, like I said, and the amount of time you need to be on blood thinners depends on a couple things. We have categories of what we call provoked and unprovoked DVT. So if it's provoked and we know that clear cause of it, usually it's a shorter duration because we know that that kind of was a one-time thing. But if it's from cancer or something that's irreversible, then that's usually a lifelong anticoagulation. Of course, we have to weigh the risks and benefits if somebody has had life-threatening bleeding in the past or has a bleeding disorder. We'll take that into account whether or not we start them on a blood thinner. If they have a plan for a big surgery and that's going to have a lot of blood loss, we'll either hold the blood thinner, hold off on starting it until after the procedure is done. And in situations where somebody is not able to go on a blood thinner and they have DVTs in their legs, we're concerned that these might travel to their lungs. We put something in called an IVC filter or an inferior vena cava filter, which sits in the inferior vena cava, which is the big vein that brings all the blood from your lower body back to your lungs, just so it can catch the clot there to prevent it from traveling any further. So that brings me to our next topic, which is pulmonary embolism. And these are blood clots that are in the arteries in the lungs. So if these get blocked off, then your lungs are not getting enough blood and that can cause some big issues. People with a pulmonary embolism may have difficulty breathing, elevated heart rate, they'll have lower oxygen saturation. The location of the blood clot makes a big difference. If the blood clot's in a vessel that supplies a larger area, for instance, there's something called a saddle PE. So this is a clot that extends across the pulmonary trunk or the main pulmonary arteries so that can shut off blood supply completely to both lungs. So diagnosing pulmonary embolism, we'll do a CAT scan with contrast or a CT angiogram of the chest to look for blood clots. So for example, this is a CT angio of the chest and let's see if you can spot the pulmonary embolism. So as you can see here, this is a saddle PE. It is stretching across to both sides of the pulmonary vasculature. These types of blood clots can cause the patient to be very unstable. It can affect the heart and put some strain on the right side of the heart. So in these situations, we may do something where we give a clot busting agent called TPA, or we may have a cardiologist or interventional radiologist go in, go right up to where the blood clot is with a catheter and directly give the clot busting agent right on the blood clot, or they might try to take out the blood clot altogether called a mechanical thrombectomy. So patients with DVTs typically do not require the intensive care unit. Sometimes they don't even require being admitted to the hospital. They can be monitored on blood thinners at home. But somebody who has a pulmonary embolism, particularly one that is affecting the big pulmonary arteries will need monitoring in the intensive care unit, especially if they had these procedures that either went in and got the clot or gave the clot busting agent directly to the clot. And finally, the most rare but most popular these days is the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. I thus far have seen one in my career. So what are the cerebral venous sinuses? So these are the veins that drain the blood from the brain. This is a type of stroke that involves this system of veins. So how common is it? Not very, it's extremely rare. There are about five in 1 million cases per year. That is 0.0005%. And like I said, I've personally seen one. This typically affects younger women. Um, I believe the median age is 34 years old in females and around 42 in males. How do these patients usually come to the hospital? They usually have a headache, they'll have dizziness, they'll have weakness on one side of the body. The patient I saw had, was confused, had headaches, and treatment for this is similar to all the other blood clots, either a blood thinner or a neurosurgeon needs to go in and get the clot. So these patients are typically monitored in the ICU. We monitor their neurostatus very carefully to make sure that 
there's no major changes. There's also been more buzz about COVID patients and blood clots, and this is true. I can, I can tell you I've seen patients come to the hospital with COVID and also have blood clots. And this includes patients who have been in the hospital, so that alone can be a high risk of blood clots, but also people who come in from home and have found, are found to have blood clots at the time of diagnosis of COVID as well. I'm just gonna leave a diagram here showing how common or rare each type of blood clot is in the general population. We already discussed the, the things that can increase the risk of blood clots. Some, but not all of these patients require monitoring in the intensive care unit. Very briefly, I'm sure some of you are wondering my opinion on the J&J &J vaccine being halted. I can understand why they did so. This is not uncommon for an adverse reaction that's reported for a medication or device or vaccine being temporarily paused so they can investigate whether or not there is any link between the two or if it's just a coincidence. Like I said, the risk in the population is very low and the percentage of people in the population and people who have received this vaccine so far, I believe it's six people have the side effect out of almost 7 million. That fits the incidence of how common this is or rare this is in the general population. My understanding is most of them were young women, so they did fit the appropriate age group for an increased risk of this or increased prevalence of, of a CVST. I think that the FDA is doing their due diligence, but I don't think it's a cause for alarm like the media is making it seem. And a lot of the reporting I saw from the media was either incorrect or misleading. Many of them did not state the number of patients who experienced this. It was six out of almost 7 million, 6.8 million administrations. And, and also they didn't give a comparison to how common or rare this is in the general public to compare and say, well, out of this many people, we would expect X number of people to have this disease process. So would these people have had a CVST around this time, even if they did not receive the vaccine? It's hard to say. That is exactly what they're investigating right now. I don't want to downplay it and say it's no concern at all, but I think it's something we need to take a step back and look at the full picture and also see if these people had any risk factors to begin with. So that's my take on that. If you have any further questions about blood clots, please leave them in the comment section below. I'm happy to make a second part to this video. Like I said, I just know that most of you will not come back for it. And But if I see a lot of recurring questions, I will address them. If you found this video interesting or helpful, please feel free to share it with a friend. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at TheIntenseMD, and I will be back on Friday with another video.